Welcome to the How to Play Battletech Advanced Tactics Series, Commander. This video is intended to be a definitive guide on how to get the most out of the weapon phase in Classic Battletech. In order to bring you the best information available on YouTube, I interviewed players who consistently find success in online global tournaments and incorporated their strategies and tactics into this guide. If you're one of the few who make it to the end of this video, you'll be well on your way to mastering Classic Battletech. Let's get started. Okay, so weapons. Uh, what's the best way to think about weapons, and uh, how should we use them in Classic Battletech? So, uh, the purpose of weapons, very simple. Uh, we're using them primarily to remove mechs from the battlefield, and we want to be doing that as fast as possible. As fast as possible. So let's think about the ways that we can uh, kill a mech as quickly as possible. The first way is the headshot. So we pop it in the cockpit, kill the pilot, it's dead. Uh, fast and effective. So next way is am ammunition critical. So we crit the ammo, triggers an ammunition explosion, does, you know, typically 100 plus damage to the mech. The mech dies. Uh, that's a nice, fast way to bring it down. The other way is center torso destruction. So plug it right in the CT, um, destroy the engine or gyro, it goes down. And the other way, uh, technically, you don't destroy the mech, but you blow its leg up on a light mech, and uh, you chop its leg out. A lot of its defense comes from its speed, and um, yep, yeah, that's it. Uh, it's it's an e pretty much an easy pickoff or an easy kill after that. Okay, why do we want to do that? And um, what well, we want to do that to get up in the initiative count. Um, a lot of these concepts in Battletech are linked. Uh, we talked about the initiative in the last um, in the last presentation. But here, uh, it, here's a scenario where it's six versus six, and in this scenario, um, whoever wins initiative gets to go last, right? And so, um, in in the first scenario, B wins an, uh, B, B wins initiative, so they get to go last. They get to make a move with perfect information. Um, they get to see where all of A's Mex goes, and they get to make the best move. And in the, in the reverse scenario, uh, A wins initiative, and they get to get, take the last move, and they get to see where all the mechs go before placing their last mech in the perfect position, okay? But something very interesting happens um, if you get to a 5 versus 3 situation or in some initiative counts where um, one opponent starts, starts winning more. Um, you start to snowball, and you start to win harder. Uh, I can show you here. So in this scenario, um, A has taken out a bunch of B's mechs. So A has lost one mech, he has five, and B has three mechs. Um, when B wins initiative, A gets to move two mechs second to last. So, and then and then B gets their uh, gets their last mech. So it's, you get a bit of advantage here um, with, the, with the double activation um, against these other two mechs because these, these mechs now, it's hard for them to understand where these two mechs go and it becomes really apparent um, when A wins the initiative in this scenario, uh, A wins the initiative in a 5 versus 3, B makes his last move, and then A gets two double activations, meaning B has to account, uh, B's mechs have to account for where two mechs um, could go, where in a 6 for 6, he was only had to account for, um, he only had to account for one. So uh, numbering opponent uh, creates an advantage, and remember, this is a mech advantage, not a points advantage. So... A could still be technically behind in battle value, but he could be ahead in units, and he would still have this advantage. So two mechs or two units can act with perfect information, harder for opponent to predict. They, these mechs also don't have to worry about any kind of counterattack because they see exactly where B is going to go. They can make the best move, and yep, yeah, you start to snowball. All right, as a secondary objective in the weapons phase, um, we kind of want to go for knockdowns. Um, knockdowns meaning you knock it over an opponent's mech. Why? It lowers their enemy, uh, it lowers their accuracy. Uh, they get a minus one to hit, right, from moving when they stand up. Typically, they're going to want to stand up. It's going to limit their their movement options. So movement, I uh, believe it takes two points of movement to stand up. And so um, when they stand up, uh, they can't move as far, so it becomes very, you know, predictable. You can start maneuvering your mechs in, and it does a little bit of damage, but I think these first two points are, are a bit stronger. If you're playing narrative uh, or in a campaign, uh, and the campaign allows, you can start to capture mechs, you can start negotiate, uh, negotiating, you can start ransoming them. Um, typically, you want to do this later once the battle is won, so in a 6 for 6 scenario, maybe it's 6 versus 2, and then you start to negotiate uh, some kind of ransom or reward. And yeah, um, those are the benefits. So how do we do this? Um, I have a whole set of tactics prepared showing you exactly how, uh, how to go about doing that. But before we do that, we need to talk about, um, what to use specifically. We need to be thinking about weapons, um, a little differently than we had before. So weapon types, 
Um, I want you to think of weapons when you look at uh, that weapons list. I want you to think of them as different tools for a job. And uh, there's several different categories that I think we should go over. We're going to need a mix of them, okay, right? So you can't have all of one, uh, one type of tool, as we'll see. Uh, you can't use all hammers for the job. You need your hammers, your wrenches, your drills. Uh, you need them working in combination to get the job done, okay? By the end of this uh, presentation, it should make it very clear to you that lances are teams and should be designed as teams. Um, not as skilled individuals. Now, I see a, uh, this question a lot online. How do I build a lance? How do I go about doing that? Um, and this is for people, I guess, that want to build a, an effective lance. I think people are asking that um, because they want to build something that's effective, that works. Um, certainly, it's completely valid to just take your favorite mechs, your four, four favorite mechs, and throw them in a lance and, and call that a lance. That's certainly um, a fine way to play if you want to go about it. But I, I think when people are answering that question, um, they're asking about how do, how do I build something that's effective that works on tabletop. I don't think you should think of it like um, just taking your four favorite mechs and putting them on the table. I don't think you should think about it like um, taking one of every weight class, one assault, one heavy, one light, one medium, and throwing it on the table. I don't think that works. Um, and I don't think it should be by design. I don't think you should just throw four Jenners on the table and call the Lance. I don't think you should um, throw four Panthers on there. I don't think you should for throw four Centurions. Not all of one design. Does doesn't work like that. Um, I want you to think of, I want you to think of creating teams with the right mix. And I know that's a Fedcom kind of way of thinking, but you want you want to think of these like basketball players with different skills, right? Some are centers, uh, some are big centers, some are um, lighter, you know, lighter point guards. Some are outside, some are outside shooters um, in basketball. People with different uh, combinations of weapons and armor and speed, and you're using them in combination to create a team. Okay. I'm going to show you that. So in our example, uh, we have a Centurion CS9A, very classic um, mech. We're going to be using it for targeting practice in order to show you how to use uh, these different weapon types. It's got 136 armor here spread across its locations. It's got two ammo locations, so 40% chance to explode on the left torso on a crit, 66% chance to explode on the right torso on the crit. So not the best mech. Um, typically on a better defensive mech, you'll have like one ammo, ammo location, and this, the, the, this percentage will be dropped a little more, but... Um, for this example, this, this Centurion is a little bit vulnerable once you hit the internals. Um, so yeah, I think uh, should demonstrate things nicely. So the first type of weapon is the piercing weapon. That's the autocannon 10, autocannon 20, the PPC, and the large laser. Um, its purpose is to punch a hole into armor, right? So you're picking a location, you're blasting it open. Definition, large amount of damage to a single location. And I define that as 8 plus damage in Secession War. So here's our example here. Bang, you hit it with a PPC. Uh, 10 damage to the left leg, 10 damage to the right torso. All the other uh, locations are pretty clean. They're full, but we took this down significantly, okay? So that's the first first weapon, and you follow this up with critical hit weapons. So these are the SRMs, the short-range missiles. You're using these to critically hit open locations. It's defined by small doing a small amount of damage to many locations, right? So you're rolling the cluster table with these missiles, and then they're um, bang, 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 bang. They're hitting all over um, all of the mech. And the point is to get one or more damage uh, on the internal structure in order to trigger a critical hit roll. Once you trigger, a, a, once you hit an internal structure on every single hit, there's a 41.7% chance, eight or higher, to trigger at least one crit. So here is our example. We shoot our SRMs, bang, 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 bang. They scatter all over the all over the mech, but we get lucky. We hit two SRMs into the right torso that already had been damaged by this um, by this PPC and bang we hit the right torso and it's just 66 41 percent uh, chance to crit and if we do get a crit off 66 uh, percent chance to hit the ammo explosion and instantly destroy the mech right <clears throat> so we can think of this like a um, why do we need to use both um, we can think of this from an efficiency standpoint so if we had only uh, if we had only critical hit weapons, We'd be sandblasting this guy's uh, entire armor off, right? We'd have to grind through all 136 points of armor with these two points, and um, you know that wouldn't be very efficient. You can see from here, we only had to take off um, a fraction of those pips in order to start triggering a crit, right? If this was a crit, 66% chance, pretty decent, pretty decent odds to blow this guy up on a crit, right? So very efficient, very quick compared to trying to grind through his entire uh, through his entire armor. Um, on the other hand, if we had only piercing weapons, piercing weapons tend to be very heavy. 
Um, there's you only can carry a few of them, so they're a bit inconsistent. They're a bit random with how they roll. Not like um, you know cheaper weapons. You can kind of spam them and kind of even out your dice rolls like that. Kind of play the odds. But you only got a handful of these um, piercing weapons if you run all of them. Uh, really hard. Um, really hard to take down a mech, and you're still at the same, um, kind of the same situation where, uh, you're not really triggering crits too much with them because they're just punching holes, and every hole punch is, um, is is a crit versus, um, versus on a uh, on an SRM, you kind of get a bunch of a bunch of triggers or potential triggers, right? Okay, so one archetype I'd like to talk about is self sufficiency. Um, these are mechs that have both pierce and crit built into them. So we can go through a couple of examples. Um, why is this good? Well, they're self-sufficient, so they're easier to slot into lances. They're kind of more well-rounded than other specialist designs. So some examples of this are the Panther right here. It's got a PPC to punch and a SRM to crit out, right? Osrock, two large lasers to punch, an SRM4 to crit. Orion, AC-10, and then two SRM-4s. Warhammer's got double PPCs and SRM-6. And then the Thug has two PPCs and two SRM-4s. When you compare this to a mech like the Awesome with only piercing weapons, um, you, can, you can see why there's an advantage to having this um, self-sufficiency archetype. The Awesome here, very good at punching a hole, but it needs someone to follow up. So you need to... Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more needy um, with, with its lance mates. You need someone with crit. And then same thing with the Kintara, right? Three SRM6s. So it doesn't have that punch, but it has that crit. So you need someone you need someone on your team to open the way for the Kintaro first. All right, the next type of weapon is the ranged weapon. Um, its purpose is to force the enemy to move to you. So if you have more ranged weapons than your enemy, let's say you have 100 missiles, they have 40 missiles, uh, you're happy to just sit in your position and pound them from long range because you're trading 100 and they trade back 40. You're eventually going to win uh, you're going to win that fight. It's also uh, better at initiative syncing. So missile boats, uh, mechs that run mostly missiles or are built around the missiles, are quite easy to use, quite uh, quite good at initiative syncing. You just kind of set them up in space, into, into place, and you just start pounding them, as we saw in the uh, initiative presentation. We define this by 12 hexes at medium range, um, or the weapon being able to do, uh, being in medium range at 12 or more hexes, right? Contrasting this, so the opposite of this, are the efficiency weapons. Um, their purpose is to do high amounts of total damage and to expose, help expose a weakened location. So these weapons are very, very efficient, um, heat to weight wise um, at doing damage mechanically, right? High efficiency. Um, their drawback is the medium laser ha has a short effective range. Um, it's in medium range at six hexes or less, so you really need to close. Um, but once you do close, fights become a lot deadlier. In fact, it could be argued that um, that the weapon is really built around, uh, sorry, the game is really built around um, the medium laser. Because once you close, um, a lot of the medium lasers and the SRMs come into medium range. Uh, mechs start dropping really, really quickly. Okay, so this, uh, this example is going to show why you need a combination of ranged and efficiency mechs. So in this example, red has too many ranged weapons. So it's got two longbows to protect it by a single Centurion. Blue is running a more balanced lance, so a lance that can play forward and back. And the solution here is for when blue sees this, um, red has too many ranged weapons. They just close to six X's. Um, they're using cover along the way to mitigate their damage, and they just carve the enemy up in the brawl, right? So once you get into... Uh, once you get into brawl range or hand-to-hand um, -hand with these longbows, they're inside uh, their minimum range, and it's really hard for them to hit. And yeah, you just you just close, carve them up into carve them up in the brawl. What happens when you have too many uh, efficiency weapons or close range weapons? So here, blue again, um, running that balanced lens composition that can kind of adapt. Um, red with the uh, all close range, all close range weapons. King Crab's got AC-20s, uh, Hunchback's got AC-20s and, and some lasers. And then the uh, Javelin has SRMs, so they're all close range. Their game plan's really obvious. They, they need to get into uh, medium range or, sorry, medium range with their um, brawl weapons. So they need to get into six sexes or less. So we know exactly what they're going to do. They're going to push forward. How do we counter that? Um, we want to soften up the enemy as they close. So we want to use this awesome. We want to kind of play around this awesome. Awesome pounds them. Um, the uh, the Thunderbolt's going to use its LRM and large laser as you close. Same as the Centurion. The Centurion is going to use its AC-10 its LRMs. 
Um, we're using this cavalry guy to threaten attacks. So we're going to slow them down with cavalry. And then we're going to reposition slightly to account for uh, this javelin. We're going to bring this uh, centurion in over. Um, it's hard to run a lance with only close and efficiency weapons, as we saw in the initiative phase. If you have a lot of greedy mechs, uh, mechs that want to get uh, the last turn, uh, all these mechs are now competing for the last turn, and it's hard because they don't have any kind of flexibility or too much flexibility. If they're out of six hexes, if if they're out of these uh, that close range, uh, they don't really get the value. Okay, so this is the movement that we're going to do. All right, so now here in this position, we shifted over our Centurion Awesome. So now uh, the Javelin's, you know, it's, it's harder for him to flank. Although we'll probably get a flank off the Awesome. Uh, it's pr still pretty tanky. The Awesome's still pretty tanky. We should be okay. The Centurion can now um, hit the Javelin and threaten it as it tries to come around. Um, the Extended Torso just will help here. The Thunderbolt is positioned to block when the King Crab finally gets in. And this Wolverine's creating a lot of problems for this Hunchback. In fact, I would argue that the, these guys are going to have a really hard time to um, move forward anymore. Um, as long as the Wolverine holds its turn uh, for a strike, um, th this Hunchback now, it, it's in deep trouble. Um, it needs to you know move defensively. It's not going to be able to get here as soon as possible. And in this way, the Wolverine is helping its team by slowing down this main attack. Okay, so you need a balance, right? You need a balance of range and efficiency. Um, some specialist lances, as we'll see later in our lance video, will be able to break this or be able to build... Um, build kind of specialist formations, but for now, I think this general uh, this general balance lens is a pretty good example, pretty good pretty good one to play with. Okay, so there are a couple of archetypes that I want to talk about. Um, the first one is the flexible range archetype. So these are mechs that have both range and efficiency. Um, that makes them very flexible when you use them or when you include them in their lances um, because they can contribute reasonably well at all range brackets. Um, lets you again, yeah, play into many compositions. Um, and you're usually getting some kind of value off of this mech, even if it isn't in its optimal weapons range. So uh, the uh, Thunderbolt and Orion are kind of brawlers. You kind of want them inside. Um, six X's or less to do damage. But even if you don't, um, both the Orion and Thunderbolt have LRM systems. So pretty sizable LRM 15s and a large laser on the Thunderbolt and an AC-10 on the Orion. So you can still get some value, even if you're out of position. They're also very... Uh, very tanky, so uh, which which lets you kind of play them in the middle of the initiative. Um, you're not too fussed uh, if you don't get, I guess, perfect positioning on them. So examples: Thunderbolt, Centurion, Orion. These are all flexible range type mechs with both range and efficiency. Um, you compare this to a Hunchback, which always wants to be in six, six hexes or less, or it doesn't really get the full value. Um, a bit harder to play. And then the Archer, um, even though it has the backup medium lasers, you don't really want to be using them. You want to position it um, at uh, where, where its LRMs are effective. And so it's a little bit more needy. It kind of needs uh, that protection or that screen in order to be uh, be successful. Where, whereas the Thunderbolt and Orion and Centurion don't really need it as much, as much. Um, the other archetype is a Missile Skirmisher. So this is like the flexible range type, except that you're adding speed to this. Um, a bit harder to use effectively, but you can pick the range um, to fight at. So if you don't have initiative, meaning you have to go before your opponent, you can just set up and trade with your missiles or lasers. Um, but if you do have initiative, you can move into a range bracket where your opponent is weakest and um, choose to trade at that range. It requires excellent piloting. It's pretty hard to do um, real time in a game. But if you're playing maybe a more narrative focused game or you're able to focus on just a single mech, like your character is only piloting the catapult or your pilot is only carrying uh, piloting the dervish or you're only in charge of two mechs or something, um, it's a lot easier. It just requires a lot more uh, brain power, I guess. So some examples, the Catapult and the Dervish. Um, again, they've got LRMs, medium lasers, and jump jets. Dervish has LRMs and uh, SRMs and jump jets. So you can see here, um, this breaks down at what ranges do LRMs have an advantage against these various weapon types. Um, and the speed on those missile skirmishers allows them to move into these range brackets where they have good trades. So with the SRM and medium laser, you want to be at 10, uh, five, 5 to 10 hexes. You can see here... Um, you're trading, it's impossible to hit um, with the medium laser where you're putting it plus two. And then uh, they're at long range, so they're, plus, they're taking a plus four modifier 
um, to hit, so it's a lot harder for them to hit, where you're at plus zero, plus two, and then even a bit inside um, inside minimum range, you're only at plus one and plus two, and then at uh, five hexes, you're trading at equal um, at equal uh, at equal modifiers. Yeah. Um, okay, AC ten and large laser. Again, there's a small, there's this four hex bracket that you, if you can float around, you can uh, keep them at arm's length. You can keep them at uh, plus four, and it's easy for you to hit at plus two. So you're creating these trades for yourself. Um, you don't, again, you don't really want to be taking fights at long range uh, too often. So even if you could hit them uh, and it's impossible to hit back, mm, I think as range is closed, you want to you want to move it medium. I think this is okay in the early stages of the game, but then you kind of want to hold them at arm's length at uh, and trade at this plus two, plus four. PPCs, very, very hard to do, but still possible. You have this very narrow range bracket at 13 and 14 hexes where you do have an advantage. Um, pretty, pretty difficult since you probably want to be in, in cover and, and moving. So this one's very difficult, whereas these are these are a bit easier to pull off, I think. The last type of weapon is anti-infantry. Um, its purpose is to destroy infantry. Um, mechanics does just does a high damage to infantry. Uh, machine guns do 2d6, flamers do 4d6, and then uh, the missiles, each missile, I think, if you're running infernos, uh, do three damage to infantry, if I'm not mistaken. A uh, bit harder to find a good balance for this since um, you use these in combined arms, um, missions and scenarios, and if you're a newer player, you typically don't really mess around with combined arms too much um but yeah it's good i think good narratively to have at least a couple of these just to say like hey if it does come up um i will have a backup um and that's the definition just kill infantry efficiently okay let's go into the tactics portion of this presentation and cover what you need to keep in mind in order to be successful in the weapons phase so first off um who should we target first tactic i'd like to cover here is focus firing um, here we want to commit enough weapons to remove the threat entirely or remove the mech entirely from the board. Um, why we want to do this, um, like we mentioned before, we are doing it in order to get up in the initiative count, right? Um, by outnumbering your opponent, you have an advantage in the initiative, in the activation phase, um, which will help you outmaneuver and help you snowball the game. Keep in mind that crippled mechs are still initiative sinks. So, for example, if he has a mech with no weapons or a mech with no legs or a cracked hip, um, and it's not completely destroyed, he can still activate it early and use it as an initiative sink. So it's better to completely destroy the mech when you have time. You want to estimate how much damage you need. Uh, you don't want to overcommit too many weapons. You don't want to fire everything, everything, and waste the damage. But uh, at the same time, some overkill is okay. So um, estimate how much you need and just do a little bit over. If you can't destroy the mech, the next thing you want to do is shoot for knockdowns. Um, how do you do that? You try and get at least 20 uh, 20 damage on the target, um, which will force a pilot check. Um, this will make it take extra damage if it falls down. Um, but even better, it's going to reduce the accuracy of the mech because it has to get back up, which will count as movement. And it will limit its further movement options, make it easier for it to predict uh, where it's going to go. Okay? So some good combos uh, to try and trigger knockdowns. Uh, two LRM-20s, like on the Archer or the Longbow, uh, hitting with two LRM-20s, they'll on average do about 12 damage each. And... Uh, That'll be enough to trigger a pilot check. Uh, two PPCs, like on the Warhammer or the Marauder, um, Banshee 3S um, has an AC-10 and PPCs, or even something like an Awesome um, is very easy to trigger knockdowns with. PPC and LRM-20, also a nice combo. The AC-20 by itself, so a Hunchback, if it plugs you with the AC-20, you're going to make a pilot check, um, which is another reason why the weapon is so strong. Um, and a PPC, an LRM-20, and then two Brawl weapons, so if you have two mechs kind of ganging up. So you want to try and commit enough weapons. Uh, if you can't destroy it completely, at least try to get 20 damage on the target. Uh, you can get an advantage and start stacking these small advantages um, over the course of the game. Other thing you want to do is consider the effect of the damage. In this example, we have a large laser, two medium lasers, and SRM-6 to fire. Um, we have a first target in Awesome, which has fives to hit, 83% chance to hit, so very easy. Uh, Locust, which is eight, eights to hit, so harder to hit, 41.7% chance. But in this case, uh, we want to consider how much uh, the damage itself will affect the mech. Um, to the Awesome, the Awesome's going to be able to shrug this off no problem, assuming it's full at full armor. Um, so even if it's easy to, easier to hit Awesome, easier to hit the Awesome, we might want to commit our weapons to the Locust instead. Um, we know that a large laser to the leg of the Locust will open it completely, and then we have a couple of weapons to follow up and try and crit it out. Um, hitting with all these weapons on the Locust uh, will certainly um, put it in a really bad spot, if not, if not um, trigger, trigger a few critical hits so in this case even though it's 
it's harder to hit the locust we want to commit the damage um commit the damage to it all right the next section is maneuver and weapons and the relationship between maneuver and weapons um in this tactic close to medium range um notice here that changes to the hit percentage have large consequences so we want to close um we want to have our mechs close to medium range uh when the main when the main fight starts and this is usually when mechs start to close into brawl range uh when your frontliner starts to close into brawl range we want to make sure we get all our weapons even if they're range mechs um, or skirmishing mechs we want to bring all our weapons into their medium range we don't want to hang our archer back at long range even though it can um, we want to bring it forward into a more dangerous position where it can absorb hits and but but it's also hitting better so in this example here um it's a regular gunner uh, a regular mech pilot at piloting skill four um, we're assuming that the target moved uh, we're assuming the targets in cover and then all that all that changes here is the, is the range modifier and you can see here there's a 17 percent chance to hit with uh at long range but a 42 percent chance to hit at medium range so keep that in mind bring all your weapons into medium range uh when the fight starts otherwise you're losing out on a lot of uh damage and and yeah you're just not gonna be trading efficiently okay the other thing you can do um to start stacking the odds in your favor is to rotate to the weak side um rotating hit changes the hit location table so let me break this down for you this is the percentage chance to hit um if you're targeting the mech from the front or targeting a mech from the front you can see here it's fairly evenly spread with a 20 percent chance in the center torso um, but if you're able to rotate either to the left side or the right side you're able to change the percentage chance to hit on one of the sides um this is particularly important on cavalry um so things like the wolverine um and the kintaro which can um start moving you know pretty easily we want to rotate to an enemy mech's uh location where it has an ammo explosion chance so if it, it's packing ammo in the left torso we want to rotate to the left side um or it has a weak leg something like um a, uh, it's particularly effective on lights so getting on the left or right side of lights is, is important things with uh low leg armor so if the if the fight progresses and something gets you know hole punched in the leg you want to rotate there um to either to the left or right side whichever one you opened up um especially important on the on the warhammer since it has um it's notoriously low leg armor you can see the percentage cha uh change chance here it's the highest change on the legs and then uh you have 5.6 chance change on the left torso so you're getting about 20 percent of the time um if you rotate to uh to the sides it's not huge but it does add up it does add up all right uh the sequence of weapons so how do we fire um this relates to the piercing and crit we generally want to uh we want, generally want to shoot our weapons high to low um we want to do this we want to shoot our piercing first and our critical hit weapons last we want to select the mechs that have piercing weapons first and the crit weapons last and we want to do it for um their weapons as well if you're if we're talking about uh mixed uh, mechs with mixed weapons like the thunderbolt and the centurion here so the first mech i would uh it activate would be the awesome then it would be the centurion then the thunderbolt then the wolverine and then i can kind of pick between these two okay and then when i'm shooting them the awesome uh, is opening with its piercing weapons is all through the same weapon so it doesn't really matter which ppc i shoot but when it comes to the centurion i want to shoot the ac10 first because it's a piercing weapon then i want to follow up with my medium lasers because they're doing five damage each and then i want to shoot my lrm 10 uh that's shooting a packet of five and then it, it's going to splatter it's going to hit a second location um with its second its second grouping of five same thing with the thunderbolt shoot my large laser to pierce first then follow up with the uh medium lasers and then lastly uh and, th and then shoot my um excuse me then shoot my lrm system and then you know all the other weapons when it comes to the wolverine shooting my ac5 and my medium lasers because those are um doing you know five packets of five damage and then uh i'm shooting my srm which is doing clusters of two right it's it's spreading across there so shoot high to low for both the mechs and their weapons okay okay uh, another tactic is to hold heat weapons um this forces the enemy to account for heat gain it overall if you do this properly it's going to lower the amount of return damage they can do um so it's kind of like a crowd control um ability in battle tech so who are you going to mount um inferno ammunition on mechs with two tons of srm ammo so you're going to load uh, one ton of regular and one ton of inferno if you decide to go this route good mechs to do this on are the javelin 10 and the kintaro 18 so the kintaro has two srm6s that the javelin has sorry the kintaro has three srm6s the javelin has two srm6s um and i'm still experimenting with this but you might want to try and take um inferno rounds on mechs with srm2s that can heat 
that can manage their heat well or keep their heat relatively low. So things like the Shadowhawk 2D that can't really push its heat and the Thunderbolt uh, 5S. Again, I'm not um, completely convinced of this yet. Something I'm still experimenting with, but I think this is a possibility. So I'll show you the tactic here. In this example, uh, the Warhammer is squaring off against the allied Thunderbolt. Um, <clears throat> under normal conditions, the Thunderbolt would activate and declare its attacks, and then the Warhammer would declare its attacks. If it's still trying to punch through armor, right, it's using its piercing attack, so it's firing two PPCs. In this uh, scenario, it's at four heat, so four plus 20, and it sinks 18, so its final heat is six heat. But everything changes when, if you're able to get a Javelin uh, with Infernos behind it. So Javelin 10N, one ton of regular, one ton of Inferno. If it hits with one, uh, one or two of its missiles, it's going to add usually anywhere between 6 and 15 heat, which is going to throw the calculations, as we'll see, of this Warhammer off quite a bit. So the activation uh, weapons declaration, the Thunderbolt's going to declare its weapon to shoot. Now the Thunder, uh, now the Warhammer has to declare what weapons it wants to shoot. If it now if it shoots two PPCs, um, it it has to you know, uh, calculate, okay, how much damage do I take from Infernos? It's hard to calculate. 6 to 15 damage. So the final heat could be anywhere between 12 and 21 if it hits. And that, uh, at that point, you're running, the Warhammer's rolling, you know, not to shut down and not to explode. So really, really risky here. Um, if it decides to do it, do it and push its heat, you're going to fire your Infernos. And then this is really neat. If it decides instead, okay, I'm going to shoot one PPC instead of two, um, then it, the, the final heat, right, even if it hit, even if it gets hit with the Infernos, its final heat's going to be between 2 and 11. It's just going to take a minus 2 to move it at, at the worst. Um, if it decides to do this, then you just fire normally. You just fire your regular uh, SRMs and you do just the full damage. And in this case, um, it no longer takes heat. Uh, no longer heat takes heat damage. But um, it, you end up making it sink negative 4 heat, right? So it, it's wasting efficiency. And uh, so it's wasting efficiency and you reduce the amount of incoming damage. Okay, now this is a really sweet dream scenario, but in this scenario, uh, the Thunderbolt's in a 2v1. Uh, it's really in trouble here. It's facing against a uh, Orion and a Warhammer, and you get this Javelin in support. So now normally, instead of firing the LRM-15, the AC-10, and the medium laser, it's down to an AC-10 because it has to account for the heat. Um, and this Warhammer is down to one PPC. So the activation would look like, um, assuming that Blue won the uh, weapons declaration, uh, the Orion would fire its weapons, it would declare, then the Thunderbolt would declare its weapons, and then uh, the Warhammer would declare its weapons, leaving the Javelin, so you'd hold this heat weapon until last, um, and then punish them if they decided to push their heat, and if they didn't push their heat, then you just fire your uh, regular damage weapons. Okay, and a question I get a lot is, um, are you advancing the timeline? Um, yes, I am advancing the timeline. I do want to start tackling... Um, uh, going, going beyond the Secession Wars and moving into uh, Clan Invasion. And these are the list of weapons that um, become available at which weapon date, uh, at, at which dates to uh, the Inner Sphere factions. So keep your eyes peeled for a video going over this. Um, we're going to get really deep into the weeds. We're going to dive into the mechanics a lot, and efficient. We're going to look at a lot of efficiency formulas and stuff, and try to figure out which ones um, are good in which cases. Um, especially important if you're into like building and variants and and into optimization. Okay. Alrighty, that's it for this video. Uh, join the Discord for lecture notes, and I'll see you next time.